Absolutely. So feel free to ask anything, and if we run out of time, you can we can go in the hallway and you can you can grab me. Uh, so first of all, yeah, thank you very much, Iman, for the for the invitation and, and warm, uh, warm welcome. And this is my first time to to be in the city, and it's been very impressed. Yeah, just in terms of the uh, the environment here at the university, it's just it's so fantastic. You should feel very privileged. You have a great medical center and medical school and. Really, all the pieces are here to do high quality, impactful medical research. So it's fantastic. Um, OK, so uh, before I get going on into my talk, I'd have to have one slide to tell you about my department. So I, in addition to being a professor at UIUC, I'm the, the head of the department. So I'm obligated to brag about my department for a little bit, and then I'll go on and I'll, I'll talk as a professor would talk. Um, so, uh, so we do have a bioengineering uh, department at UIUC. We're about 20 years old. Um, we've got about 30 faculty in total, eight, about 18 or 19 of those are tenure track. So we're kind of a medium sized department. Um, in terms of our size, we have about 375, 380 undergraduate students. Um, oh, that 88 PhD students, that's the old number. We have about 125 PhD students um, and a number of master's students, and, and we're growing. Our faculty is extremely research active. Uh, so the research expenditures per year per faculty member on the tenure track is about a million dollars. So everyone in the department is very uh, successful and aggressive at funding their, their research. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say is just, uh, I know that your department here is aggressively growing very innovative educational programs, and we're doing, doing the same. I just wanna point out a few of the new programs um, that we're really proud of. We have a new Bachelor of Science degree in Neural Engineering that just launched. So we're the first department in the country to offer BS in Neural Engineering. Um, next year, we have a new hybrid degree um, going online that combines computer science and bioengineering. So for people who want to do work at the interface of computing and biology, um, we're happy about that too. Um, so anyway, yeah, you can look at our website if you want to learn more about the department. But now let's go on to the, the science, um, the, the, the reason why I'm here. Uh, so in terms of my background and my interest, I am a computational imaging scientist. And so I'm interested in using mathematics, uh, physics, um, machine learning to find new ways to form images. All right, um, so the, the bread and butter in my lab is imagery construction, which is basically corresponds to solving an inverse problem to form an image from a collection of, of measurements. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, some examples of projects going on in my lab are, are here. We're working on, we have quite a diverse a range of projects. We're working on new imaging modalities. Photoacoustic computed tomography is an area we've been working on for a while. Um, ultrasound tomography, X-ray phase contrast imaging. So these are new modalities um, that are being developed, but they're not at the point where they're in the clinic yet. So we're interested in these emerging modalities, getting them to work so that they, they can be hopefully translated ultimately. Um, and we do a lot of uh, machine learning for all of, all of these things, of course. And then kind of related to what I'm going to be talking about today, in my lab, we're also interested and in, in fully engaged in what I would call kind of more fundamental imaging science research, right? So we're interested in kind of some abstract questions related to imaging. Um, I've given some examples of those questions on the slide. For example, um, what type of information is lost during an imaging process? How do you quantify that? How do you use concepts from linear operator theory to describe imaging systems? How can you design optimal data acquisition um, strategies so you can acquire data in a smart way that's most informative? Um, these are questions that are relevant to any imaging technology. So I, I kind of view these as fundamental in the sense that they, they transcend any one imaging technology. Um, and so these are this is sort of you know along the lines of what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm not going to be talking about today solving any particular problem like how we detected cancer. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to be talking about very fundamental abstract ideas. How do we think about evaluating machine learning uh, from the perspective of an imaging scientist? And feel free to stop me along the way at any time. Okay, so the specific outline is here. I'm going to start off with a very brief mini tutorial to describe how I think about image quality. How do I think assessing the quality of images in the imaging system? Um, 
And then once we have that background in place, I'm going to apply that perspective to a couple of case studies. One case study is going to have to do with image denoising using deep learning, trying to understand, OK, well, is it always guaranteed to help? Right? Or is it, does it just somehow make a pretty picture? Um, in another case study, we're going to address a generative AI and trying to understand, um, well, what's actually being learned when you, when you use a deep generative model applied to medical imaging. At least I'm going to give you some, some insights into how we think about answering that question. Um, and then we probably won't have time too much for the last topic, but the last topic I'd like to talk about hallucinations and tomographic imaging. Um, so I might, might, might get to that a little bit, but that's, that's, um, that's a little bit uh, involved. So let's talk about image quality. So let me just quick take a quick survey. How many, how many folks in the room are working in the area of biomedical imaging? Okay, so not that many, good. Okay, so hopefully I can get everybody up to speed um, quickly. Um, so, you know, it stands to reason that you know, anytime we want to optimize the performance of an imaging system, we need some figure of merit to describe how good the resulting image is, right? So that's what these image quality metrics refer to, right? And so image quality metrics can let us compare images produced by different modalities or by the same modality when we vary some sort of parameter of the image system, okay? And certainly, I mean, image quality is a very, very uh, widely known concept, right? Even if you don't work in imaging, the, the concept of or the notion of image quality must be familiar to you, right? Um, at least in some sense. But really, the image quality assessment can be divided. Here's two camps, two ways of thinking about it. One is we can think about using physical-based or traditional measures of image quality. Let me give you some examples of these that, again, are intuitive and you know about. For example, if I give you an image, you can, you can judge how sharp the image is, right? And you can tell me this is a good image or a bad image based on the perceived spatial resolution, the sharpness of that image. Similarly, you could try to quantify the noise. If an image has some, some grainy noise in it, you could try to estimate the noise level in an image, and you could use the noise level of, as a figure of merit to tell me, oh, it's a bad image, good image, right? You could compute the contrast of some structure in the image, and you could say, okay, um, if the contrast is higher, then that image is better. Right? You take ratios of these things that contrast to noise and so forth. You get the idea. These are what I'm calling physical traditional measures of image quality, and they're fantastic. So I'm not going not to say bad things about them. Um, well, kind of I am, but, but um, we need them still, right? Um, the other the other class of image quality thinking that I'm going to be talking about today is a task-oriented image quality assessment. And the basic idea here, and I'll talk more about this in a moment, is that we should judge an image based on how useful it is. So if I give you two images, right, and you're um, you're designing a medical imaging technology, you should tell me image A is better than image B if image A is actually more useful for the intended task, right? Medical images are usually acquired for specific purposes. Not always, but usually they're acquired for specific purposes. When a woman goes into the clinic for breast cancer screening and gets a mammogram, they're looking for, you know, they're looking for microcalcification clusters or masses or some signatures of breast cancer. That's why the image was acquired. Right, so uh, if that's the goal of that imaging study, it kind of stands to reason that okay, well, I should sort of incorporate, I should incorporate the, the usefulness of the image into how I assess whether it's a good image or not. That's how medical imaging scientists tend to think about image quality. Um, example of why we can't just use the physical-based image quality measures alone, and this is a, a nice computer-generated example that my my classmate Matt Kupinski, who's at Arizona, gave me. Um, so look at the bottom row. This is just an example of three computer generated images, just disk. They're just disks of different radii. Okay? That's big. On the top row, these are the same disks, except noise was added to them. But the noise was added to those three disks in such a way that the contrast to noise ratio of all three of those images in the top row are the same. So if you're going to use contrast to noise ratio as a measure of image quality, you would say all of those images on the top are equally good. But on the other hand, if I ask you to kind of um, give me some perceptual um, assessment of how detectable the disk is in the noisy images, you wouldn't say they're all the same. You can easily see the big disk, even though there's noise. You can kind of see the medium-sized disk. The small disk, you probably can't see. Right? So the detectability of that structure is not the same. So contrast to noise ratio is not a good figure of merit if our ultimate use of this image is to detect the disk. Does that make sense? Are there any questions about that concept? This is why we need to take the next step and we need to compute image quality using task-based measures. Right? And again, this is, I pretty much already said, this is, this is cartoon to, to describe what I just said. 
Um, but again, biomedical and medical imaging, we like to measure the image quality to quantify the, the, the usefulness of the image. And when I say the usefulness of the image, you could say, in other words, you know, the, the image can be used to, to um, detect a structure or perform a particular task, right? So as I, as I stated here, task-based measures of image quality quantify the ability of some observer, some observer, the person or the algorithm working with the image, reading the image, to perform a particular task. And in, in medical imaging, common tasks are signal detection, like the cancer detection that I already mentioned, or parameter estimate, estimation, trying to estimate some quantitative parameter from, from an image. But, and final uh, backup slide, or second, second to last backup, uh, background slide. Um, so I mentioned we need, we need an observer. We need, to, we need to bring an observer into the process if we want to compute task-based or uh, image quality. Right? And in medical imaging, humans, radiologists, for example, are often you know, the observers who are working with the images and making the change. But um, in the early stages of technology development, as engineers, it's not practical for us to go bother radiologists every time we want their opinion about how good an image is, right? It's just not practical. So in the early stages of technology development, we'll substitute a human with a numerical observer, basically a, a computer algorithm. And so a numerical observer is a computer algorithm that performs some sort of image-based inference, whether it's a detection task or a parameter estimation task or some combination of those two. Um, and there's different types of numerical observers, and I won't go into it, but I'll just quickly mention them. There's the anthropomorphic observers. These are numerical observers that are designed to mimic what a human would do, right? So in other words, I want to implement a, a pattern, a pattern uh, recognition algorithm that performs the same as what a human would perform when acting on those images, right? That's what an anthropomorphic is. Another, another numerical observer that's relevant to what I'm going to talk about soon is an ideal observer. Um, an ideal observer is a, basically an observer that adopts the um, optimal decision strategy, right? So the uh, ideal observer implements the optimal decision strategy. There is no better observer. Right? It, it does not exist. Right, and so it's hard to implement these ideal observers, but sometimes we can approximately uh, implement them, and that gives us upper bounds on what is the best possible signal detection performance, for example, that we could expect from an image or an imaging system. And deep learning is enabling the implementation of all of these different flavors of numerical observers. Um, and I pretty much just said this. So my lab, we in fact we we love ideal observers, and we published a series of papers on how to approximate ideal observers using deep learning, but I won't, won't go too much into that. Okay, so just to summarize before we go on to this case study. Um, so we know that biomedical images are often required for specific purposes, right? It's different than the camera in your cell phone where you're just randomly taking pictures of stuff. In medical imaging, we usually have a purpose to the images. And therefore, um, you know, objective or task-based measures of image quality are really relevant and, and they're important, okay? Um, Objective image quality assessment requires us to do a couple things. It's not necessarily easy for us to estimate these measures. Um, we need to first we need to specify what is the task to be performed. In other words, what is the image going to be used for? And then who is the observer, whether it's a person or an algorithm, um, who's going to be performing the task. Okay. And uh, just to motivate the case studies, um, you must know that deep learning is having a huge impact in the field of medical imaging and medical image processing. But very, very infrequently are, are deep learning you know, image processing methods evaluated from the perspective that I'm talking about. They, they are, but not, 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 not enough. Um, before I go, any comments about just that? That was my quick, my quick lightning quick gesture on image quality. Is any quick comments? Or, are you guys on board? Okay, yes, okay, You're good enough. Okay, so let's, let, let's go to our first case study here. Um, and this has to do with using deep learning to denoise images. Okay? And image denoising is a classic problem in the field of signal and image processing. It's been around for decades, well before deep learning became a fad. I mean, the basic idea is I have some noisy image. Somehow I'd like to do some sort of processing of the image to remove some of the noise from the image so it appears less noisy. Okay. Um, so deep learning has been um, employed very successfully for this problem. And I've got a schematic of of a canonical deep learning approach on, on the slide here. Right, so basically the input to our network is some noisy image that we want to denoise. Then we have some network, and here I've denoted the network as just sort of a canonical convolutional neural network. 
that's comprised of a different number of convolutional layers with nonlinearities spaced to, you know, between the layers, however you want. Um, and then the output of the network is our estimate of the of the noise damage. Okay. And so if you adopt a, a conventional supervised learning approach, the idea is let's assume that I have pairs of the noisy and the less noisy images. If I have a bunch of these pairs, then I can train a network to simply map a noisy image to a less noisy image. And to do that, you have to specify some loss function. You minimize that loss function. You estimate the weights of the network. And, and there's a lot of details there, but that's the, the basic idea. Okay. Um, so um, this, this, is, this is all fine. I mean, so what we're going to be doing in this case study is assessing whether a denoised image is actually more useful than the original noisy image, right? So the, on, the, on the schematic I have here, on the slide I have here, I say the denoised image looks somehow better than but does it mean that this image is more useful? You would be tempted to say yes, and sometimes the answer is yes. Often it's yes, but it's not always yes. So I just spilled the beans, but let me go through. Let me go through. Okay. So we want to understand basically. I formulated the question here. Um, do stress denoising operations always improve signal detection performance, um, even if traditional measures of image quality are improved? This is the question we like to ask, right? And this is an example of a question that you do not see asked very often in the literature because people are you know, just busy trying to solve their problems. Right? But this is kind of a, a fundamental question. So let me let me uh, show you an example of a, of a study that we did. Um, and we use computer simulated images because in that case it was convenient. We could generate as much data as we wanted. And importantly, in that case, we could control all sources of variability in the data, right? So we, the data were well characterized. So it's a nice test bed for us to investigate questions like this. Here's examples of the computer simulated images we used in our study. On the left, this is an example of the background. So these are images that are somewhat reminiscent of a nuclear medicine scan, if any of you are familiar with that, like a PET or a PET. But we basically have a background image that has a bunch of lumps in it. Um, and we generated a large number of them. I forget exactly how many, a couple thousand of those background images. Then in half of those background images, we inserted a signal, which in this case is just a simple Gaussian blob. But we inserted signals into half of them, and then to all of the images we had as noise. So basically it looked like this. We, so at the end of the day, we had a bunch of noisy images, but half of these noisy images had signals inserted into them. Okay? And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to train a denoising network um, to denoise these images, and then we're going to try to detect the signal that was embedded in there, and we're going to see if the denoising operation the network actually helps us. That's the goal of this study. Okay. Um, so again, I'm getting ahead of myself. I just said I just said this, right? Okay. So in order to quantify the signal detection performance, we need to specify some numerical observers. And this slide describes the three numerical observers that we use to detect the signal. Okay. So again, if, I mean, if, there, if the term numerical observer is still foreign or awkward to you, again, in this context, you can just think of a numerical observer as some pattern recognition algorithm that we implemented to automatically detect the signals from the image. Okay. And so the three, first is the ideal observer, and that's like the big boy in the block that I just talked about. So we have ways of um, approximating the ideal observer. And again, that's going to um, tell us what is the best possible signal detection performance that we can get. That's kind of an estimate of the upper bound on signal detectability. Okay. The second is a suboptimal um, observer called the Hotelian observer. Okay. And so the Hotelian observer is suboptimal, but it's, 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 it's actually the optimal linear classifier. It's, it's whatever term citation for you. The thing I want to point out here is that when you implement the Hotelian observer, when you compute the test statistic, you need to know what the second order statistical properties of the image are. That case of G, um, that's the covariance matrix of the image data, of the noisy image data. Okay. So if, in order to implement the hotelian observer, we need to estimate the covariance matrix. And by the way, if I go back up to the ideal observer, I didn't tell you what statistics, image statistics the ideal observer uses, because the ideal observer does whatever the hell it wants. But the ideal observer will use any statistics that are useful to make an optimal decision. So it's very likely that the ideal observer uses higher order statistics in addition to just second order image statistics, whereas the hotelian observer is limited to only use second order image statistics, like suboptimal in general. And then finally, the third uh, numerical observer we implemented was just a simple match filter. Right? And the simple match filter uses only first order statistics. 
So when you go from top to bottom, this is going from like um, powerful to least powerful, most powerful to least powerful. But we implemented all three of these because it's going to be, it'll give us some insights into what statistics are being perturbed by the denoising operation. We do so. Okay. So before we go on, let me um, first look at the covariance matrix of the denoised images. So we had all we had all of those noisy images. We trained a network, then we fed some of the denoise, fed some of the noisy images through the denoising network, um, and then we computed an empirical estimate of the covariance matrix of the denoised images. And that's what I'm showing here. Okay? And so let me walk you through this. So in other words, on the y-axis, um, these are the singular values. Okay? So we had the co we had the covariance matrix. And then we did a singular value decomposition of the covariance matrix. For those of you not familiar, it's a way of basically decomposing the the, um, the covariance matrix into different components that are that represent different levels of importance to to the action of the matrix. So we have singular values on the y-axis, and on the x-axis is the index of the singular value. And uh, again, for those of you who are not familiar with SVD analysis. Um, when you, when you do SVD decomposition of a matrix and you plot the spectrum of the singular values, how rapidly those singular values decay tells you something about the ill-conditioned nature of the matrix. Right? If the singular value decays more rapidly, that tends to tell you that if you were going to try to invert that matrix, um, you're going to have a harder time right? because you have to divide by singular values when you invert the matrix. So ideally, we want when we plot singular the singular values of the matrix, we want that the curve to be high, right? Because that means the matrix is well behaved and we can invert it. If it's low and if the singular values decay rapidly, it means it's a, it's a signature of an ill-conditioned matrix. Okay. So um, let's start from the top here. The good news is, well, this curve here, the solid red curve, this is the spectrum of the singular values when we decompose the noisy, just the original noisy images, right? So it's the highest. When we go down here, this group of this group of curves here, these are the singular value spectra corresponding to the denoised images, um, where the different curves correspond to the use of different denoising networks, right? Where we vary the depth of the denoising networks. Right? And as we start from the top, we have a blue curve here, and then a red curve and a yellow curve. When we go when we go from top to bottom, it corresponds to making the denoising network deeper. So what this is telling us is that. As we make the denoising network deeper, um, the conditioning of the covariance matrix is getting worse. Right? Somehow, the second order statistics of the denoised images are being perturbed, and they're being more perturbed as we make the depth of our denoising network um, um, higher, larger. Okay? So this is interesting. So this, I mean, if you know, if you think back to the hoteling observer, um, this could give you a clue what's going to happen when we start to detect because the hoteling observer needs to invert the covariance. When it, when it computes its test statistic. So here, there's a lot on this slide, but this is basically the take-home point for this case study. So I'm just going to take a moment and walk through it carefully. Let me, let me start with this bottom table here. And in this bottom table, I'm reporting the traditional physical measures of image quality. And here, I've chosen two. The SSIM, which is a Structured Similarity Index. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's a measure of how similar the, you know, the denoised image is to the original image. And on the bottom, it's just a root mean square error in the in the in the second column here. Okay. Um, in this first row here, I show the SSIM and the RMSE computed on the original noisy images, right? Point it's 0.36 and 75.4. If we have over head over to the right here, now these different columns represent the results corresponding to the denoised images when the denoising network had different depths. I consider depths of three, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. So let's start with the RMSE. When we when we when we apply when we compute the RMSE on the noisy images, it's 75. As soon as we denoise the images, um, it drops. So it goes from 75 to 13. Now, if I denoise the images using networks of larger depths, the RMSE continues to decrease, even if it's a small decrease. But basically, there's a monotonic relationship between the RMSE and the depth of the noisy network. The deeper the denoising network, the smaller the RMSE. Right, so that's kind of what you would normally expect, right? If you talk to a computer vision scientist, they're going to say, "Yeah, of course, that makes sense, right? It has to be that way, right?" And you probably heard this mantra in the deep learning community that deeper networks are better. This is this is consistent with that. And the same story with the SSIM. The only difference here is that for the SSIM, a larger value is better. Okay, um, so that's fine. So the bottom the bottom line here is that from the perspective of the traditional image quality metrics use a deeper denoising network. It's going to give you a better image quality. 
but now let's go up to this top curve here. These are showing the task-based image quality results. And um, so essentially, the uh, what I'm plotting here is the uh, the area under the curve. So basically, this is a measure of signal detectability on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, again, it's the number of convolutional layers. The red curve corresponds to the ideal observer results, green curve, the hotelian observer, and the pink curve, the, uh, the simple match filter. Okay? So if we start with the ideal observer, the dash curve represents the ideal observer for performance when applied to the original noisy images. So if you don't do any denoising, you just apply the ideal observer to the original noisy images. That's what the performance of that dash curve represents. As soon as we denoise the image, we see there's a decrease in AUC, and the decrease uh, continues to get um, more significant as the number of convolutional layers in the network increases. So as we make the denoising network deeper, the ideal observer loses more information, or it performs worse. You see the same story with the hotelian observer, where the behavior is even more prominent. Um, and then with the non-white, uh, non-pre-whitening match filter, um, it doesn't really care too much about the depth of the network because that observer doesn't care about higher order. So, um, so what we saw here is just one simple example where uh, you know deeper networks led to better, quote unquote, traditional image quality, but they led to worse task-based image quality. I'm not saying this is always going to happen. Certainly, it will not always happen. But this is just an example to remind us that it can happen so that we, when we want to develop and deploy these type of technologies in the clinic, we really need to evaluate them in meaningful ways. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that's basically what I said there. Um, yeah, so that's, I think, um, let me move on. Let me move on. If you're interested, we have some papers on this and you can, you can email me. But, are there any quick questions about, uh, about that? Okay, let me move on to the, the second case study. And this has to do with generative AI. So even if you don't work in imaging, you must have heard of generative AI. It's all, all over the place, affecting the stock market and, and you know, ch changing our world. Um, so deep generative models, and that's generative AI, what I'm gonna refer to generative AI is deep generative models. That's my term for that. Um, they're used all over the place in, in imaging applications, and it's a, it's, it's a wonderful, exciting tool to use for imaging applications. Um, so in this case study, we're going to talk about trying to understand the quality of images produced by generative AI or deep generative models. And the thing I want to point out is that, um, you know, deep generative models, they can produce, they can synthesize fake images that look plausible, but they could be completely wrong, or they could, could have error, errors in there. And... Um, in medical imaging applications, this presents obvious problems, right? If we're going to use a deep generative model in part of a medical image processing pipeline, we, you know, we need to have faith that this is going to be producing structures that are real and not hallucinating and make, making things up, okay? But unfortunately, there's no guarantee of that. And because there's no guarantee of that, we need to look carefully at, at these models. And um, here's some examples from the popular media some of you must, must be familiar with. These are examples of diffusion models, which happen to be at the moment kind of state of the art mid-journey stable diffusion. I mean, these are all fake computer-generated images, and they look, you know, they look wonderful, right? Um, and this is sort of just a quick timeline um, of the evolution of deep generative models, at least for imaging, for imaging applications. Right? They started about 10 years ago um, with, with uh, generative adversarial networks, which I'm going to talk more about. Um, style GANs were kind of the next generation of, deep, of, of generative adversarial networks and then diffusion models more more recently. But again, all of these pictures of faces were, these are all fake. These are all produced uh, out of thin air by a network. And is this remarkable, actually? I mean, 10, 15 years ago, you wouldn't dream that, that, a, that, a, that a network could just randomly produce images that look so realistic, right? So it is, it is remarkable. Um, of course, you know, there could be you know, misleading images. Um, so this this image of Trump this never happened, right? But it looks it looks like it did happen, right? Um, so again, just a reminder that these deep networks, uh, from a medical imaging perspective, we need to be careful because they can produce images that look realistic but are actually false. And again, um, mere plausibility of an image is not good enough for us, right? It may be good enough in other applications, but in medical imaging, it means nothing. Plausibility means nothing. We need to have more faith in. These. Okay, so in my case study, I'm going to be looking at generative adversarial networks. I'll call these GANs. So just in case, I mean, I imagine many of you are not familiar with these, so I'm just going to give you just a 20, 20 or 30 second overview. Um, basically, a GAN, you can think of it as a neural network. And this box here, this generative model box here, 
Um, this represents some neural network. Usually it's a convolutional neural network. And the basic idea is that if you train um, this neural network in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way, and I won't get into those details, but if you use adversarial learning and you minimize the right loss function and you do all the right heuristics when you train, then what can happen is that you can feed in a vector of random noise. You can basically generate a random noise vector, feed it into the network, and then on the output side of the network, it'll produce an image, right? And if everything went well and you did this a thousand or 10,000 times, then the distribution of those images that you produced, those synthetic or those fake images, would match the distribution of real images. And so that's, that's kind of a high level overview of what generative adversarial networks do. They can basically transform random noise into images, and these images satisfy a certain distribution. And this is just a demonstration of kind of the, what I mean by a distribution. So imagine that you have a database of MRI brain images. Right? You have an ensemble, you have some database, you go to the hospital, you have some collection of these images. You can imagine each of those images is being sampled from some high dimensional probability density function. Right? Right? So you can imagine you have an image, you could, you could rearrange it as a vector if you want. Right? So you could imagine each image to be a random vector and that random vector um, will be sampled from some high dimensional PDF. That's what I'm showing here with this picture. So the beautiful thing about GANs is that in principle, it lets us sample from this high dimensional PDF to generate new samples from the PDF, even though we don't have direct access to that PDF, right? So they're, that's why they're, they're called a form of implicit generative model. Okay, so let's go here. So here are some examples, again, that were one of my students, uh, Wayman Zhou, um, trained in the lab, just to give you an idea that, yeah, these things work on medical images too, and maybe some of you have already trained these. But yeah, again, we trained again on, on MRI brain slices, and these are the results. And the ones in the red boxes are actually the fake ones produced by the model, and the, the other ones are the actual ones from the clinic. And so they look look pretty good. I'm not saying they're they're correct, but somehow um, somehow they look plausible, right? But I already told you plausibility is not enough. Okay, so um, what are we going to do? So we know that plausibility is not enough. You know, we don't care about generating pretty pictures in medical imaging. We care about producing images that are useful and can be used reliably. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, it's remarkable. But no, one, even though they're seemingly working well, no one really understands what image features or what image statistics are being reliably captured by these deep generative models. Right. Um, and that's really, really concerning. So the objective of this case study is to kind of show you one way about how we think about evaluating different deep generative models from the perspective of medical imaging. It's very, it's very simple, and that's why I summarize the basic approach here. Um, basic approach has four steps. In the first step, we're going to compute a large collection, of, an ensemble of simulated images that we're going to use to train a GAN. Okay? Um, and, and we're going to simulate these images in such a way that we know precisely what all of the statistics are. Okay? And that's why it's useful to do computer simulations in this context. Okay? So step one generate a bunch of synthetic data using an algorithm that we know statistically, that are statistically characterized. Okay, step two, once we have this large collection of, of, of images, we're going to train again. Okay. We're going to train a generative again or some other, whatever generative model you want, you can substitute when I say GAN. Okay, once we've trained the GAN, in the third step, we're going to use the GAN to produce a new collection of data. We're going to sample new images from the distribution using the GAN. Okay. So now at this point, we've got two collections of images. We've got our original one um, that we used to train the GAN, and now we've got a second collection of images that were fake, that were produced by the GAN. And in an ideal, in an ideal world, if everything went well, these two collections of images should be indistinguishable by any measure. But of course, nothing ever goes truly well, right? So then we're gonna basically extract statistics from both collections of images and compare them and see which statistics the GAN learned correctly, which ones it did. So it's a simple, but I think it's a principled approach that you could apply to evaluate any sort of deep generative model. And this was work done with people from my lab and also collaborators from, from the FDA. Example of the of the image, the training images that we created. So these, these are on the top row, these are the training images. And there's actually five different types of these fake images or these, these directly simulated images that we created. You may know, you may notice those of you who were, were involved in medical imaging. These image patches, they kind of look like mammographic texture. So if you've ever seen a mammogram, 
this kind of looks like a patch from a mammogram. So it's sort of a, it's like a texture model. So we have basically five of these texture models in each of these columns on the top, and these are showing examples of the of the, simu of the simulated images that we can see. So basically, for each of these each of these five texture models, we computed a bunch of training data, and then we trained them. So at the end of the day, we have five trained bands, one for each. Then in the bottom here, these are showing the GAN generated images, the fake ones that were produced after we trained the GAN. So these two are supposed to look like that, these two look like that, and so forth. So visually, they kind of look similar, right? I mean, it, if, if we mixed all these images up, I mean, it, it would be hard for you to distinguish them. At this point, I would say it passes the plausibility metric clearly, right? But let's go ahead and see what really got learned. First, we looked at the first and second order statistics. So what we did was we um, computed the autocorrelation function from the images and we radially averaged it. And that's what we're showing here. So, so basically, these radially averaged autocorrelation functions, uh, they tell us something about the second order statistics that were learned. And in this case, there's a blue curve and there's an orange curve. Um, the blue is the real images, the original images. The orange are the fake images, the images produced by the GAN. And the curves overlap, right? Pretty convincing. So this is saying, okay, well, let's check this box off. The GAN somehow learned the autocorrelation function of the images. That's fantastic, okay? Um, but what about the higher order statistics, right? Did it, learn this, the, uh, did it learn the complete covariance structure of the image? Did it learn the third, fourth moments? Did it learn, did it learn what did it, didn't it learn in, in terms of the higher order statistics? So to do this, um, I, have this I have this pipeline, this workflow here. Um, so what we did was, we, again, we have our directly simulated images, and then we have our fake images. That's the top box and the bottom box on the left there. Um, for each, we generated a large number of images, and then we extracted features. We extracted 17 texture features from each type of image. Um, from these extracted texture features, we performed principal component analysis, and we kept the top two principal components. Okay. Um, and what I'm showing here are basically heat maps of the top two principal components where the blue heat map corresponds to the true images, the directly simulated images, and the orange heat map corresponds to the GAN generated images, to the fake images. And um, we can see that in some cases, um, there was good agreement. So if we look at OPEX 99, if we look at Dvori, these two, those heat maps overlap pretty well. It means for those image types, the GAN actually learned these statistics well. Um, but if we look at some of the other examples, for some of the other image types, um, there is not a lot of overlap. There was a, it basically failed, right? And there's not a lot of overlap here, here, here right? So it shows us that um, it's a confusing result. So sometimes for certain image types, for certain texture models, the GAN learned some of the higher order statistics correctly, but for others, it didn't, right? Even though we used the same GAN, the same training procedure, the only thing that was different was the training data, um, but it had an impact on what the GAN could learn or not. Um, so that's kind of interesting, right? So uh, to summarize this case study, um, you know, the GAN produced um, visually plausible images for all of the different texture types. Um, the first and second order statistics uh, were correct, at least as measured by the um, autocorrelation structure. The higher order statistics were sometimes correct, not always. It depended on the texture type, the texture model we were using, okay? So are they good enough? And that's a reasonable question. And the answer it depends what, what you want to use them for, right? So again, I'm not here to claim that this GAN failed or not. I'm just here to demonstrate how we think about assessing these models and, and proposing some very simple pipelines that you could do yourself to, to assess them. Okay? But clearly it's very complicated, right? Clearly it's very complicated, which is maybe why people shy away from this. Um, so just the take home points for here. Yeah, uh, deep generative models, they are fantastic. I mean, to be honest, they're my favorite form of, of deep learning, right? I mean, it's just from an imaging perspective, you can use them to learn priors that can constrain inverse problems. All types of just wonderful things you can use generative models for. Um, however, uh, hopefully you're starting to get the message. I can't I sound like broken record, but your know, traditional evaluation metrics from the machine learning community can be misleading when applied to medical imaging problems. Um, in general, the extent to which application relevant statistics are being learned by a deep learning model is unknown. And that's the application relevant statistics, that statistics, that's the key verbiage here, right? Where you're going to use these for a particular application, you need to understand what statistics are important for that application, and then you need to validate whether your model is actually learning those statistics. And just because your model produced an image that looks good, it doesn't mean it's learning those statistics, right? 
Um, and therefore, we, you know, we just need to be careful how we object to these tests. Um, OK, and so yeah, finally, um, yeah, so we did, we had a wonderful collaboration with the FDA on this project. I'm not sure, some of you may be surprised, like this has nothing to do with food, right? But uh, let me just remind you that the FDA actually plays an important regulatory role. So any sort of medical imaging device or medical technology has to be certified, regu regulated by the FDA. So the FDA has a team of scientists and physicists who are scrambling to figure out how to regulate AI technology in medical imaging. And so we're collaborating with them. And we recently hosted a, a challenge where we released 100,000 um, simulated breast images. And we, we challenged the community to train their own form of deep generative models and see what type of statistics um, they could learn. Um, so if you're interested in training your own GANs, we have a lot of data available. Here are some examples that you might find interesting of some of the failure modes that the uh, that the participants ran into. Um, in this particular um, breast model, these um, these uh, ligament structures here, the, the, the kind of wired mesh that's filling the inside of the image, the, these ligaments are supposed to be connected. You shouldn't have any ligaments just kind of hanging out there. They should all be connected to something. But if you look here in these boxes, you can certainly see examples of where ligaments were just terminated in midair, right? They weren't connected to anything. So again, these are errors that the deep generative model made when it was synthesizing images. Um, so again, when you stand back from a distance, oh, it looks reasonable. If you look in, clearly something bad happened. Um, here's examples of uh, maps that show the diversity of images produced by different deep generative models, right? Because that's another that's another interesting topic. Um, when you train a deep generative model and you use it to produce new fake images, there's a question in, in that. Well, are these fake images displaying the diversity that's actually present in this in the distribution that you want to sample from? Um, so the, in the upper left hand corner in the red box, this is just showing the mean image of, of basically the training images. So we took 10,000 training images and we just naively computed the mean from it. And that's what that heat map in the top left is showing. The other images are the mean images computed from 10,000 fake images produced by deep, different deep generative models. And you can see the one in the middle on the top. This one doesn't look too bad, right? It kind of has a uniform um, brightness similar to the training image. But all of the others look wildly different, right? So again, it's just it's just a very naive way of, of looking at the performance of the of the deep generative model and being able to detect that okay, something didn't go quite right, right? Um, okay, um, I'm wondering if I should even stop now. So I did want to talk about one other topic. It has to do with tomographic imaging. Um, but it's 12:45 now. What do you? Oh, go, oh, I'm seeing a thumbs up. OK, uh, let me maybe I'll give a high level, high level overview of this. So this is this is probably the most abstract of the topics, but it's actually the oh, I love this stuff. So OK, so let me quick switch gears now. We're going to be talking about tomographic imagery construction, right? So basically how we, we measure some sort of data and we want to process that data to actually form an image, just like it takes place in MRI, CT, PET, SPECT, almost any major um, modern medical imaging modality. Okay, so machine learning and deep learning is being used within the context of this problem also. Okay? Um, people are just very aggressively coming up with new ways to, to learn how to reconstruct images for measured data. And, um, and sometimes it, it looks very interesting, but in other times these neural networks and these machine learning methods can produce images that, okay, you're probably going to guess what I'm going to say, they could have false structures in them, right? And we can't always trust the neural networks, right? Um, and these false structures uh, are generally referred to as hallucinations in the machine learning community, right? Because the network sort of hallucinates, it's making up some structure that shouldn't shouldn't be there. Okay, so um, so in my lab, we're very interested in, in topics like this, trying to understand um, how to quantify hallucinations. Um, but interesting enough, until recently, there was no formal definition for what a hallucination is within the context of tomographic imagery construction. Like kind of in a colloquial sense, yeah, it's something false, right? But in terms of precisely defining it, like I want you to define it, it is lacking. So, um, so what we did recently was we we used concepts from linear operator theory and we proposed definitions for what hallucinations are in tomographic imaging, right? Um, and why is this important? You may you may ask. Well, I mean, hallucinations generally um, occur because the network did something wrong, right? 
Um, but in a Bayesian sense, you can think of it as the network learned a prior, uh, a prior that describes the distribution of objects in future reconstruct. And it didn't learn the exact correct prior that it should be, right? So one way of thinking about hallucinations is that they're caused by, by use of an incorrect prior in an inverse problem. And so here, here are some examples of some problems that you may encounter. Some, you know, why would hallucinations arise in, in deep learning applied to medical imaging? And why do we need why do we need to be careful when we use deep learning for medical image reconstruction? Okay. And you may know about some of these already. The first is that okay, well, you know, many neural networks are black box. We don't really understand what they're doing. We can't interpret them. If we can't interpret them, you know, it may be difficult to trust them. Right? That's just a general comment for all all black box deep learning methods. Um, the second um, has to do with generalizability, right? When we reconstruct an image using a learned for example, a deep learning model, we want to have confidence that the model is going to perform well, even if we use it to reconstruct an image from some data that were statistically different than the training data that we used to establish that model. Right? That refers to the generalizability or generalization performance of the model. Right? If, a, if a model doesn't generalize well, it's kind of useless in a practical sense to us, at least. And then the, the third thing has to do with um, the stability of a learned mapping for an inverse problem, such as image reconstruction. Right, so it's interesting. So if you look at these images on the bottom, um, the image on the left is an example. It's not a very, it's not a very pretty image. Kind of happy image but this is an image of a knee slice reconstructed from MRI, MRI data. Right? Um, that's fine. The image on the right is basically an image reconstructed from that same data almost, except a small perturbation was added to the measurement data before we used it to reconstruct an image. So that's what the delta is here, right? right? So this delta is small. But even though delta is small, when we reconstruct the image, there's still some large artifacts. So it just shows you that the learned image reconstruction mapping can be instable in, in some sense. So these are reasons why we need to be careful when we when we use machine learning for image reconstruction. Um, so uh, let's see, am I going to make it here? OK, let me let me just walk through a couple of things. Um, and feel free to tweet in the next 90 seconds. Um, if you're interested in this, but basically, let me walk you through a mathematical model. This is a simple canonical model for tomographic imaging, right? So any imaging system can be represented by an operator equation G equals HF plus N, right? Any imaging system, right? Um, and often, if we approximate an imaging system as being linear, then H is a linear operator or it's a matrix in its discrete form. So what G equals HF means is G is our measurement data. G is the stuff that the actual instrument records. F is the object distribution that we want to reconstruct. H is the action of the imaging system. So H is, a, is an operator that mimics, that models the action of the imaging system. So let me back up a second. So in practice, if we have an imaging system, what do we do? We put an object in the imaging system, we press a button to record data. Okay? So the object that we're putting in the imaging system, that's F. When we press the button and the imaging system does its thing, that's H. So H acting on F. That's our model of the imaging system, and G is what gets recorded. Right? And then, of course, there's always some noise that gets added to our measurements. Right? Now, image reconstruction has to do with inverting this, has to do with the exact opposite of this. Image reconstruction is, okay, I measure G, I want an image F, right? How do I, how do I invert this, this equation? Okay. So X-ray, CT, MRI, any, any tomographic image modality you can think of, it's this, right, in, in abstract form. Okay. And um, you may think that, oh, but this is no big deal, just act H inverse, act it on G, done. But the problem is, um, you know, that operator H is generally not invertible. H inverse doesn't exist. If it does exist, it's unstable. So we really have challenges when we want to try this equation in practice. Okay. Um, and so from a Bayesian perspective, um, and let me tie this into machine learning in a second. From a Bayesian perspective, Inverting that equation, doing image reconstruction, some people would, would advocate, well, image reconstruction is equivalent to estimating a posterior distribution, the probability of F given G, right? Um, so if I know that posterior distribution, I can compute the mean or the mode of that distribution to get an image, I'm done. Right? This is Bayesian's perspective, right? But, it, it, but even if you're a Bayesian, to estimate that posterior is very difficult. And um, the key thing here is that the posterior can be estimated by multiplying the likelihood of the data, the probability of, of observing the data G given F, F T of G given F. We usually know that likelihood just from the physics of the problem. That's not the issue. But then the next term is T of F. That's the prior. 
That's the object size, right? We need to know that if we're going to compute the posterior. And that's the thing that we don't know. That's problematic, right? And why am I showing you this? Because when you use machine learning methods to, to perform image reconstruction, then either implicitly or explicitly, you are trying to estimate that pi, that P of that term. That's the whole deal, right? That's why you're doing this. Even if you don't realize it, that's why you're doing it. You're trying to estimate that pi. And if something goes wrong in your learning procedure and you don't estimate a useful pi, that's when things can go wrong in the image reconstruction process. That's when you can see these errors or these hallucinations. Okay, that's the quickly, uh, lightning quick summary of, of, of a high level view of hallucination. And this problem exists uh, in um, single image super resolution. In the, in the uh, computer vision world, people view hallucinations differently. So this is actually interesting. Um, sometimes hallucinations have a positive connotation, especially in non-medical applications. So here was a, um, a super resolution problem where the problem was, okay, give me a low resolution image of this woman wearing a shirt, feed it into a network, and give me a higher resolution image where some of the text that was their goal here. And these are different examples of the output of their network. You can see that there's different types of reconstruction that were inserted. You can see texture. And there's a way wind to this. this is a um, but from our perspective, these high frequency structures that were inserted into those images, those are really hallucinations, right? They're false structures. They were not contained in the original data. Um, but to them, it was a win. Okay. Um, if we wanted to quantify hallucinations for us, we, it's much more complicated and, 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 and involve, involves some mathematics. And the, am I, how am I doing on time here? Okay. Um, the basic idea is that if you have a linear operator, we can always decompose the domain of that operator into two subspaces. One is called the null space or the kernel of the operator, um, and one is the measurable subspace, which is the orthogonal complement of the null space. Okay. And the key point is that the null space contains the component of your object, remember you take an object, you put it in the imaging system. You can always decompose this object into two pieces. That's what I've shown here, a measurable piece and a null piece. And this null piece is always invisible to your imaging system. And that may be surprising to you, but this is a fact, right? Anytime, anytime you have a digital imaging system, there's always a component of it that is invisible that the imaging system will be blind to. That's the component that lives in the null space of the operator. Okay? Um, and um, so basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut short here, but I won't go through the details. You can follow up with you. Basically, using these concepts, we define meaningful definition for what are hallucinations in the null space of a linear operator. And this lets us understand and isolate errors that machine learning based reconstruction methods are making due to learning an incorrect, incorrect object class. Right. And again, I'm sorry I'm rushing through this for about out of time. And this is this is yeah, this is um, detailed stuff, but I hope I gave you at least a flavor for what, what this is about. So we like using basically you know, mathematics and, and physics and machine learning, combining it in a way that we can meaningfully analyze these problems, right? And that's kind of the, our, our thing in the lab. These are just some examples of, of hallucination maps. And let me let me save this for offline discussions. And um, But let me, I can just give this quick, quick summary slide here. So we have defined hallucinations in tomographic imaging. Um, these hallucinations can be used to identify false structures that are attributable to to a suboptimal learned prior. Um, certain data driven methods are shown to result in structured hallucinations, especially when you apply to out of distribution data. And you can use this to meaningfully analyze uh, deep learning based image reconstruction. So I'm, I'm going to end here and just thank, um, thank my lab and, and the funding. And uh, I think we're about to get kicked out, but if there are any, any quick questions, I'll be happy to, to answer them. So, yeah, thanks for your attention. And I'll blame Tommy for making me go through that last part fast.
um, if you have that, you use that. Yep. That would be how much do you think that would reduce your little quality? Especially for. I mean, it's a great question. So, I mean, I can't answer the question specifically, but I will comment. I mean, this is a fantastic idea. This is how I think about it. Um, and many other people think about it. The distinction between kind of post image post processing and image formation is an artificial one, right? And I, I, that's how it is in a lot of a lot of times. I mean, there's people who just work on image analysis, post processing of images. There's people who do image reconstruction. But really, um, this is one pipeline. And if you remove the distinction between these two components in the pipeline, there are opportunities for innovation and and uh, yeah, I mean, to be honest, if a human is not in the loop and reading the images, they're, they're, you know, you can, you can combine these two, two steps quite nicely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's. So that's a good question. Those overlap maps, they'll just tell you whether something kind of went wrong during the training of those deep generative models. But the question is, if I give you, if I synthesize a fake image and I give it to you and you need to tell me is it fake or real, that's the tough one, right? Um, and so people are actively working on this, especially outside of medical imaging where it has, you know, you know, there are also immediate problems with this. Um, so yeah. People are working on it. There are ways, and there sometimes there are signatures in these fake images that consistently are wrong, and they can be used as features to flag when an image is fake versus real. But, um, but it's an important problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we're about to get kicked out, so um, I'll be happy to chat offline. But thanks, everybody. Yep. Looks like there are pieces outside waiting. If you go out this way, as you walk away. I don't see anybody coming into the classroom, so I think we have.